On an unusually warm February afternoon in 1942, a convoy of the Imperial Japanese Navy sailed through the Java Sea. Suddenly, Nachi's scout plane relayed a worrying message. Two columns of an Allied striking force were spotted nearby. As sailors donned working uniforms and officers adorned white dress attire, they rushed to their stations. Seeking solace in ship shrines, they clasped Hachimaki headbands as rising sun battle ensigns fluttered in the wind. Every officer and sailor understood the danger of an advancing hostile fleet. In a matter of minutes, the decisive battle of the Java Sea would break out. In early 1942, Japan successfully steamrolled through the Pacific theater. After conquering Singapore and vital cities of the Dutch East Indies, the main island of Java became the next target. The Allied Joint Command faced challenges such as insufficient forces and communication difficulties. After the British and American commanders left for Ceylon, Dutch Admiral Conrad Helfrich took charge. Dutch troops, especially the King's Netherlands Indies Legion, were experienced and their navy had modern destroyers and submarines. The flagship De Ruyter, designed specifically for East Indies service, had advanced weaponry. Key vessels of the combined command included USS Houston, HMS Exeter, light cruisers from Britain, Australia, and the US, along with destroyers. Challenges included older British light cruisers being withdrawn, shortages, and damage. Rear Admiral Carol Dorman commanded the surface naval forces, dealing with cumbersome communication methods. On February 18th, as the Japanese advanced onto Bali, Admiral Dorman led a night strike on Japanese vessels in Badung Strait. However, chaos ensued and exchanges of fire resulted in minimal damage. Additionally, the Dutch destroyer Piet Hein was lost. The Allies retreated to Java's main naval base, Jilajap, and the American destroyer Stuart, damaged in the engagement, ended up capsizing in a floating dry dock. As the Allies prepared for the next engagement, they realized their fleet could hardly face the Japanese. Only four 1920s-era destroyers, Ford, Edwards, Alden, and Paul Jones, were available, limiting their firepower in rough seas. The heavy cruiser, USS Houston, had suffered damage during an air raid, rendering its damaged turret useless. Meanwhile, the Japanese forces were approaching Java with a large fleet. Two columns of 56 transports, guarded by heavy cruisers, light cruisers, and a light aircraft carrier advanced from the west, while another force with 41 transports, heavy cruisers, a light cruiser, and destroyers approached the east. In total, these transports held two divisions and the headquarters of Japan's 16th Army. Admiral Takeo Takagi was tasked with protecting these convoys with a significant naval force. Smaller convoys sailed north and south of Java, screening the ocean and preventing Allied submarines from interfering. Takagi commanded a strong combat group comprising the Mayoko-class heavy cruisers Nachi and Haguro, the Sendai-class light cruisers Jinsu and Naka, and 14 destroyers. Despite favorable weather and visibility, Allied submarines failed to pose a threat as their torpedoes were malfunctioning. Though unable to attack, American submarines reported on Japanese movements, warning Helfrich. With this intelligence, Helfrich sent Dorman and an Allied squadron to depart from Batavia to Surabaya. Despite problems like the disabled gun turret on the USS Houston and a leaking boiler on the Dutch destroyer Kortenaya, the fleet departed. On February 26th, Admiral Dorman's fleet sailed from Surabaya, unable to find the Japanese. Helfrich received intelligence the Japanese were now to Dorman's northwest. He urged Dorman to set sail again the following day to intercept the Japanese convoy. Despite personnel exhaustion, the force headed north, with Dorman signaling his ships to follow and intercept the enemy unit. Takagi, receiving intelligence an Allied fleet may be poised to intercept him, dispatched a float plane while sending the majority of the convoy to the west while taking his battleships to confront Dorman's ships. The striking force was organized into two columns, 
led by Dorman on De Ruyter. The first column included Exeter, Houston, Perth, and Java, with British destroyers preceding De Ruyter as a screening force. Meanwhile, American and Dutch destroyers formed a separate column at the cruiser's rear and port quarter, hindered by older engines and weaker armor. While Dorman's ships ventured north, the Japanese had spotted their vessels approaching. They closely monitored their movements. Nachi's scout plane reported the enemy's direction and speed to its commander. Rear Admiral Raizo Tanaka's light cruiser Jinsu led eight destroyers, followed by Rear Admiral Shoji Nishimura's flotilla, and the heavy cruisers Nachi and Haguro at the rear. At 4.15 p.m., Electra identified the Japanese cruisers Jinsu and Amatsukazi. The ensuing engagement saw both sides unleashing broadsides from a distance of 28,000 yards with a combined arsenal of 20 8-inch guns. Communication challenges arose as Doorman had not yet issued the command to open fire according to Royal Navy protocol, leading to some ships holding fire. The initial Japanese shells fell short, providing the Allied convoy time to organize. Dorman then ordered a course change and positioned British destroyers for a torpedo strike. Simultaneously, he sought air support from Surabaya, but no bombers arrived. Finally, Dorman gave the order, and the Allied heavy cruisers, notably Houston with crimson-dyed shells, initiated a fierce exchange. Jinsu aimed directly at Electra, initiating a fierce exchange of fire. Perth, positioned at the rear of the Allied line, joined the barrage after Electra and Jupiter. Despite eight intense minutes, neither side scored hits. At 4.31 p.m., a Japanese eight-inch shell struck De Ruyter, but it failed to detonate. Dorman altered course, aligning both columns for the light cruisers to engage. The Japanese, led by Nishimura on Naka, unleashed 43 long lance torpedoes. A malfunction in Houston's forward main gun director disrupted gunnery control. On the fifth salvo, the crew faced the near impossible task of loading and ramming the breach by hand, maintaining pace with the other turret for 65 salvos until repairs were completed. Exeter finally achieved a straddle after a dozen salvos, creating anticipation among the crew, although initial excitement over perceived damage turned out to be unfounded. Exeter faced misfortune as a shell penetrated its gun shield at 5.07 p.m., causing casualties and severe damage to boilers. The vessel's speed significantly dropped and damage control efforts were impeded by intense heat. With six out of eight boilers inoperable, Exeter's electrical power failed. Captain Gordon altered course to avoid a collision, but communication breakdowns ensued. The confusion led to a disorganized Allied fleet, with destroyers following Exeter, assuming they missed a signal to steer to port. This led to Dorman's flagship, De Ruyter, advancing on its own against the Japanese line. Realizing the danger, Dorman ordered an increase in speed and a turn to port, while destroyers deployed smoke screens to conceal disarray. Exploiting the chaos, the Japanese closed in. At 5.27, Tanaka issued the order to open fire, with over 90 torpedoes launched in under 30 minutes. The Japanese salvo found its mark, striking the Dutch destroyer Cortenaer, which violently split into two sections and sank rapidly. Despite the Japanese launching over 90 torpedoes with only one hit, the Allies struggled to comprehend the torpedoes' long-range capabilities. Speculation about Japanese submarines arose. In response, Dorman devised a plan to protect the damaged Exeter, directing a strategic retreat enveloped in a smokescreen. Recognizing the need for cover, Dorman directed his three British destroyers, Electra, Encounter, and Jupiter, to execute attacks before rendezvousing with the Dutch destroyer Vita de Wyth to escort Exeter to Surabaya. Electra faced a fierce assault from Jinsu and accompanying destroyers. Despite Electra firing torpedoes in an attempt to retaliate, Jinsu continued its assault. Electra's turrets were incapacitated. A fire ignited obstructing ammunition supply to turrets and the ship's auxiliary boats were damaged. The ship became inoperable. 
Commander Cecil Wakeford May reluctantly issued the order to abandon ship as it rapidly descended to the depths. Of the 173 men on board, 54 would survive. Commander May refused to leave the ship and descended with her. Electra's sacrifice, while unable to prevent Exeter's damage, did score a single hit on Jinsu. This granted Encounter and Jupiter the opportunity to emerge from the smoke, launching torpedoes at the Japanese. Encounter skillfully maneuvered, launching torpedoes before Jupiter and Vita de Viv joined the effort. However, Vita de Wyth suffered damage during the maneuver, with a loose depth charge exploding and shaking the ship. Facing the loss of Electra and Cortana, Doorman began reorganizing his dwindling fleet. During their retreat, the heavy cruisers Nachi and Haguro seized the opportunity to close in and target the struggling column. Finally, at sunset, as communication faltered and signal lights were destroyed, both Allied and Japanese forces altered course in opposite directions, marking a temporary pause in the combat. Initially, Doorman's ships sailed to the southeast, but within half an hour, Doorman ordered his ships to sail to the northwest to meet the Japanese ships once again. Doorman's forces, now reduced, faced the challenge of engaging the enemy with limited destroyers and supplies. During the brief lull, Takagi seized the opportunity to recover his five seaplanes. This maneuver, however, rendered his ships nearly immobile when Doorman's force re-emerged on the scene. Meanwhile, Exeter and her escort steamed towards Surabaya. The Japanese did not expect the Allied fleet to return. In response to skepticism on Nachi's bridge, Commander Ishikawa angrily confirmed the approaching enemy ships. Takagi, caught off guard, took three crucial minutes to order his crew back to action stations. As the engagement resumed, Jinsu's flare illuminated it as a target, prompting Perth and Houston to open fire. But their shells fell short. American Commander Binford led his destroyers towards the Japanese cruisers, Nachi and Haguro. Binford's destroyers launched their torpedo attack, but all torpedoes missed. Suffering heavy fire, Binford initially steered towards Dorman, who was sailing east in an attempt to reach safety. The distance between them and the Japanese increased. Then, he received a confusing signal to follow, implying a risky attack. The Allied force changed course. Binford's four American destroyers struggled to keep pace. Binford voiced his reluctance to plunge after Dorman, noting, I'm not going in there after Dorman. That Dutchman has more guts than brains. Opting to head for Surabaya for refueling and ammunition reload, Binford, unable to reach Dorman directly, radioed shore bases to relay the message to Dorman. However, these did not reach the Dutch Admiral, as he sailed on, oblivious to the detachment of four destroyers leaving the line. The tranquility of the night was shattered at 9.25 p.m. by a colossal explosion. Jupiter, at the tail of Dorman's column, struck a Dutch mine. Of its crew, 84 died, 97 captured by the Japanese, and 83 were rescued by the Allies. Learning of Jupiter's sinking, Dorman altered course north. It wasn't until 11 p.m. that both sides spotted each other again. Nachi and Haguro headed south, while De Reuter, Perth, Houston, and Java moved north. Bright moonlight bathed the battlefield as both sides opened fire at extreme range, neither side scoring direct hits. At 11.22 p.m., Nachi launched eight torpedoes, and Haguro unleashed four at the Allied column. One found its mark on De Reuter, triggering an explosion that engulfed the flagship's stern in a sea of flame. The pyrotechnics locker erupted, sending flares and rockets soaring into the night sky. Perth, observing the calamity unfold, turned to starboard to avert a collision with the flagship. 
Houston also took evasive action. Then, another Japanese torpedo struck Java, setting off a massive fire. Perth's crew could feel the heat as Java came to a halt, tilting almost vertically. Captain Philip van Stralen ordered the abandonment of the ship, but of the 528 men on board, just 19 survived. The distinctive superstructure of De Ruyter disappeared, marking the final cataclysmic moments of the cruiser. The detonation triggered the explosive discharge of the ship's 40mm anti-aircraft ammunition. As De Ruyter descended into the depths of the Java Sea, Admiral Carol Dorman transmitted one last signal, instructing all ships not to linger but to leave survivors and make their way to Batavia. With this, Admiral Carol Dorman and 344 officers and men of the Royal Netherlands Navy joined the depths of the Java Sea. Recognizing the dire situation on the Perth, Captain Waller, now the senior officer present afloat, ordered the Perth and Houston to disengage, execute a feint southeast, and then steam at high speed to Batavia for refueling, rearming, and further orders. In total, the Allies lost two light cruisers, three destroyers, and suffered significant damage to multiple ships. Over 2,300 sailors were killed. In contrast, the Japanese suffered damage to just one destroyer with 36 sailors killed. The Battle of the Java Sea was over. The road for Japan lay open to invade the island. Dorman's sacrifice had not been enough. The battle marked the near annihilation of the Allied fleet in the region. This pivotal moment would herald the beginning of a dark chapter as Japanese land forces invaded Java. The Japanese now controlled vital resources, including the food-producing region of Java and the fourth largest oil-producing area in the world. For the next several years, Japan would be the dominant force in the region as the war in the Pacific was far from over. Thank you very much for watching this video. Please leave a like, it really helps out the channel. If there is a topic, battle or person you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and you want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 per month, you will already gain early access to all my videos without any in-video advertisements. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.